So one thing that I most certainly have to talk about is the way that Jordan Peterson frames postmodernists like Foucault. Now, you know, you can you can see his argument. He's given out about the fact that everybody's gotten really weird recently and no one likes weird stuff. Everybody would like stuff to remain normal. And you can kind of point to these heroes of the, the left, such as Foucault and all that, and be like, that's where it comes from. Those guys are bad. Those guys are evil. But me being a degenerate Nietzschean, I, I don't really like I don't really like getting told stuff is evil because that makes me attracted to it in a weird way. There could be something wrong with me though. Don't don't think that's a virtuous piece of behavior. But in doing that, I pursued Foucault. I pr- pursued him, and I um, got into his works. And I've listened to a little bit of him. He's a difficult writer to get into, but I began to realize that oh my god, this Foucault dude. He's actually despite being French, although the English hate the French, so there must be something good about them. Despite being French. He's, he actually gets it. He's very, very, very good. And this is the best place to start for our con- our cons- our, conver- our conversation about the Ubermensch because he came after Nietzsche and he was a Nietzschean. And what Foucault did is he, he essentially called himself an archaeologist or a genealogist of concepts. Now, the reason why that's such a big deal and so telling for me when I heard that first is because Nietzsche in Genealogy of Morals was the first person, probably not the first, but the, he's the, the first time I came in contact with the notion that concepts change. Therefore, history is actually vastly different in terms of psychology, depending on the era it's in. Oh, that sounds like a lot of jargon. So basically what we consider normal now was obviously completely different in the 19th century. For example, in the 19th century, they were highly taboo about sex, but they were highly, they would openly talk at the dinner table about uh, races, about the difference between races and like what we would call racism now. They were like, oh, look, those filthy Irish. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, take all their food. Yes, allow them to die. I'm uh, being a British person here, by the way. But nowadays, if you had any, if you were restrictive about sex nowadays, that's that's literally taboo. It's the opposite. And if you are, in a, if you said something like that about another race, that would be like prison, prison for you, which shows that in a hundred years, we've had this radical change in conception of the world, this radical psychological change. And of course, that's not the first time that's happened. This is actually a consistent pattern. And Nietzsche takes the genealogy of morals to show that that little inversion that I just discussed there, which is the two things become completely opposite, which is fascinating. That happened to good and evil, where obviously in the past we had the Romans walking around killing loads of people being like, this is good. Chop 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 oh look more dead people good 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 and then you had this poor person coming up and being like please sir can i please now kill me and then he'd kill him and be like that's bad that guy is weak weak is bad and then christianity comes along um with its slave morality or general slave moralities do this and it, it reframes what is the weak begging person is like that's good you should pity them pitying them is good and then the violent conquering Roman, oh, that's bad, that's naughty. And that completely changes the psychology of Rome where it becomes far less militaristic because like, the Christians aren't, the Christians don't really believe in this idea of like going out and killing people for Rome. Like, well, I'd rather, I'd rather be pious for God. And whatever you think about that, that just shows that radical shift happening. And so Nietzsche proposed at the end of Genealogy of Morals in the first essay, he says, what I propose as a, a juicy, juicy philosopher is that we should encourage people to do what I did. And what Nietzsche did is he studied words and noted that good and evil hadn't actually evolved over time. And he said, we should, we should pay people. We should give out prized essays or prize scholarships to people who sit down and do this job. This is, this is good philosophy. Most philosophers are like, oh, this is what I think the world is. Oh, this is what I think the world should be. This is my metaphysics and all this. He, he would um, give out about these people a lot because they're just sitting there and they're just essentially intellectually masturbating all over the, the all over paper and then handing it to you and being like, do you want to, do you want to look at this? What? <laughs> so he says, let's do some real, like nearly scientific philosophy. Well, I guess you would, you would call it like the, the most scientific you can be about something like this. You would study how concepts changed. And Foucault does this. This is what Foucault does. He sits around and he looks at things like discipline, power, order, and all that. 
our um, first principles, our assumptions, and he asks us how we, we got to believing them, where what brought us to this place. We would sit around and we would look at something like public execution as just animalistically insane. Jesus, what? You used to, they used to like cut people's heads off in public. Imagine that. And we, of course, think the reason why we stopped doing that is because we're good, because we always think that. But Foucault says, no, what happened there is they, they realized that publicly c- killing people made it very easy for people to understand who was doing the killing. Oh, it was the king that was killing people. And so when people got a bit upset about the world, they had a very clear conception of who was the bad person. But nowadays we, we do stuff like we put people into prisons and we, we, we break down and reform their minds. So there's no... There's no ugly public display of power. Instead, it's this really passive, slow and quiet display of power that actually reforms these people into conformed, conforming, reformed, better versions of themselves from violent into useful, that type of thing. Very interesting idea. And he goes through a variety of different ways of looking at this. He looks at mental health. He looks at crime and punishment. He looks at power. A lot of things, but power is what we're going to talk about here in regards to the Ubermensch, because he noticed that, as I just said there, the most common understanding we have of power is like Donald Trump's king of America or the monarchs are king and all that. That's the way we understand that. The person we see walking around, oh, that's the ruler. He is all the power. But if you go and inspect a democracy, for example, the queen in England or the even the president over here in Ireland, you expect, how, you inspect how that's working. They're not that powerful, like relative to the, the the infamy that they have. They have a lot of status, you know. They might probably make a lot of money on doing public speech speeches and all that. But they're not exactly all powerful dictators. They're far from it, you know. They look more powerful than they are, and in fact, and this is a, this is a dodgy thing to talk about, but you could argue that there are more advanced forms of power that are not in public. Maybe the smartest way to be in power because it would be not to be seen. It would be to hi- be hidden because that was the sort of problem with these monarchs is that people had a very clear vision of who they were. So it was very easy for them to kill them when they wanted to rebel. And so maybe once the, uh, the, the powerful people saw, oh God, look at what... Look what look at what happened to the the Bourbons in France. Look what happened to the Romanovs in Russia. Maybe we don't want to be these like monarchs walking around showing off our power. Maybe we want to try to do things a different way. And um, so they might have moved back, and then you would see what we could call a more passive version of power, and that would be stuff like the media describing how reality is. You get this from uh, I think his name is Bouillard as well, another Frenchman I believe. And he's explaining, all right, this is this is how reality looks. This is what reality is. And so you, you set up a set of these first principles. Like, as I was saying, in the 19th century, they had a first principle where, like, to- a race, talking about race is fine, talking about sex is evil. And then now we have the, the same first principles. And when w- we understand this a little bit, we realize that if you can control the first principles... If you can control the playground that the conversation is happening in, happening in, you actually have more power than the person who is walking around the pre- playground acting like king because he is only king in the playground that you created. I hope you see what to see what's happening here. So like, you know, Trump could be the king of America right now, but he can't really take any large leaps outside the playground because that would get him that would get that people would overthrow him probably like it would be too extreme he's stuck within a box and the creators of the box are the people with true power now that's one way of looking at it and that's assuming there's some type of agency behind it this is where you get people like um alex jones talking about Hillary Clinton and the globalists have a Satan and he's made the box and they're planning to get an offshoot civilization and leave us all behind with, while they break away on a, on a different planet. <laughs> or David Icke where he's like, the controllers of the box are reptiles, although I, I don't think he believes that anymore. You can see how that th- that's what he's thinking there. He's like, all right, these, these puppets 
we see Donald Trump, Boris Johnson, Merkel, and Macron, all that. These puppets, they're not really the people with the power. These people are getting held by puppeteer strings behind the scenes. And it sort of does look like that. You could, like, people would point at, uh, at like, Zuckerberg and all that and be like, they're the people who are truly in power. And then other people will come in and be like, no, there's people behind the scenes puppeteering them as well. And all right, fair enough. But I want to I wanna try to take a more, I want to try to try take a more, nuance than and we look i'm gonna steel man a certain perspective on this because i don't really know what's going on either but let's think of it this way that the people who we see representing positions of power aren't necessarily in control and the people behind the scenes who are puppeteering this might not necessarily be people Ooh, they might be memes or ideas this is a weird way of thinking but think of them like gods all right so this idea of racism or this idea of sexual taboo that you would have seen in the 19th century these were like gods that dictated the conversation of everybody and even the people in power had to obey these to some extent like a monarch who would have all the power on earth the king of the world the monarch of the world would have all the power on earth but he was only he was imprisoned by the big concept of desire for equality that was coming out of his population. The, the, the Bourbons in France, despite the fact that he had total control over everybody's life in France, he could not control the idea. He could not beat the idea. And so in some sense, we are trapped within this, this playground, as we said, and the puppeteers might be our dreams, might be our, de our, our ideas, might be our memes, might be our stories. That's a really crazy way of thinking. And so if you think about the most sophisticated form of power, that would be the ability to control the categories. Do you see what I'm saying? That would be the ability to control the first principles. So the people who tend to do that are people like priests, people of knowledge, people of the book, the magicians, if you will, this type, these type of characters who are like throwing pictures up and establishing the foundations for the dream that people live within. Because when you put people inside the dream, inside the matrix, as they would say, or the simulation that's created, all these things like the media and you know Zuckerberg and YouTube and uh, are all feeding into this stuff. They're 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 supporting the first principles, if you will, but they're still not the people in control. And then you take the politicians and the politicians walk around and talk and all that, but they're stuck within the frame. And all of us are focused on the politicians being like they're the ones with all the power and they're doing evil things. And it's this is a scary thought. Maybe there there's far less control than we think. Maybe we're a lot more led by the memes than we would like to believe. Now, that is a fascinating perspective, and this is what I believe Foucault was trying to describe, and it, it aligns with a lot of what people like Jung and Nietzsche would say, obviously, because he read a lot of Nietzsche. But in terms of a Jungian perspective, Jung is saying that, yeah, we live in a dream, and this is the architecture of the dream, and the people who can control the, the pillars to hold it up, they are the people who have the most power. And these, this might be some fucker who's just scribbling down a book like that, and it might not even be him doing it on his own. It might be this kind of collective mind among an intelligentsia, an intellectual class. Now you can be in, begin to understand how the Catholic Church would have worked, because the Catholic Church would have created an intellectual class that held ascended over all of Europe and so was in some sense the level above the kings of Europe and then therefore you have the peasants down below so the peasants would be like the kings are the ones in power but the this intellectual priestly elite that wasn't doing a bad job at all that was really on top and most people didn't even understand how to how to attack them because they they didn't really understand that they were the ones in power the same happened over in India. This is why this it's a very interesting thing when you think about hierarchies, and it's usually divided into three classes. Nowadays, we have the rich, the middle class, and the poor, but traditionally, it was the priestly class, or in India, the Brahmins, and then you had the warrior caste, which was the kings and the fighters, and then you had the, um, the working class down below. And so this is why these guys would be on top, is because the control of the categories was always traditionally, it's just, it's just the way things work is the most important thing you can have categories magic spells they control the kings 
No, no, it's a fascinating, fascinating idea. Foucault takes it a step further and explains the reason why this is so significant or the reason why you see that we've gotten less violent and we, we, we have less overt displays of power is because when the categories are strong enough and the, the, the playground is powerful enough, like our one is with modern media and all that, what begins to happen is people stop needing to be punished into obeying. And what can happen then is that the, the actual society itself begins to self-regulate. It's like each individual bee will sting the other bee if it's not obeying the categories. So you don't need a police bee walking around anymore. What will happen is if someone, you know, if someone, if someone acts weird, if someone acts different, if someone acts anti-categories, you know? For example, if someone was blatantly walking around like talking about like sex in the 19th century what would happen is everybody would just be like stop inviting that guy to parties and he'd get ostracized and so people would self-regulate and this is of course scary and dangerous because this means that we kind of like cognitive dissonance we, we 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 box ourselves into our playground and we don't let the people come in that perhaps could change it and this becomes a difficult and scary situation because how do we know if our playground is true? How do we know if our first principles are true? This is why it's so important to challenge our first principles. So what happens is inside this matrix, inside this playground with these categories, we have a, an ideal that we've all agreed on that we want to shape the world. We want to shape the people into and when they act different than that ideal, we kick them out. And so the best example of this is Christianity. What happens is Christianity, you have this beautiful community of like a load of people that you invite everybody into it. And you say, look, there's this guy called Jesus. Now he's a fucking good dude. He's a nice, chilled out lad, full of love, relaxed and all that. If all of us just act like him, things are going to work out fine. And the, it, it's pretty much, it pretty much worked out fine when people did that. Like, he's a good dude. So they're like, right, just be nice, be sound, be open, be cool and all that. So to create these communities, everybody has to become like Jesus. That's the ideal. And if you act like anti-Jesus, you walk in and you'd be like, God, I love, uh, love uh, Thor there. I love Odin. Odin's class. Like, Odin's, a, Odin's some lad. Let's uh, let's uh, let's do some let's do some, <laughs> let's do some sodomy. Let's do some drugs. Let's uh, let's go kill a few people. How about we try that? And they'd be like, uh, "Bro, no, get out of here! No, you're not allowed to do that." And so it becomes this self-regulating thing. And of course, the priest sits there controlling the category, and sometimes even telling people that person there they're breaking the, the 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 laws. They're breaking the categories and whatnot. And so you can see how the Christian community becomes a very specific playground. Everybody self-regulates around the ideal. And this is what I want to get into. This is what's so important to understand this what Foucault is describing is saying that these little matrix matrices that we create are dominated by the ideal category we have of what someone should be what thou should be what you should be is the core of what we're talking about here the should built into us is what leads everything and so you have to ask yourself Okay, well, what is this? This is, I'm coming from the Jungian angle, this is an archetype. This is the archetype of the hero, the messiah, the ideal, the best version of thyself, the best version of the community. This is an archetype and it shines with power. It, this is absolutely what Jung meant when he talks about the archetype of the redeemer and the savior. We have this idea that humanity is shit and it's awful and we need to create a community that will help solve our problems. And so we have this idea that all of us need to be reformed. These are all modern terms that are just building on the original uh, term of Catholic original sin. We need to be reformed. We need to find ourselves again. We need to change our behavior because we're, we're not built perfectly. We're, we're unevolved. We're, we're creatures that are evolving. And so we're not, you know, we're not no, we're not built like angels. We're, we're a bit broken and we're, we're kind of struggling our way forward and we're not really making sense of things. And so we need an idea of what we're going to work towards because the story that gets into our mind controls our choices. And actually when a huge community gathers around a story, a symbol, an ideal, it re orientates the choices. And this is why this is important is because we put Jesus Christ on top of this and Jung would say this is the image of the self. And this is the image of the, arch the archetype of the hero, the Messiah, which is also the self. This is what Nietzsche is saying. Or this is where Nietzsche is saying we should put the Ubermensch, and we'll get into this why in a bit. 
But that's the core thing to understand, that centralized core idea, that altar of the perfect ideal person is the story that gets in our head and orientates all our choices and our morality towards it. And therefore, the whole community regulates itself towards it, uh, towards that. And the whole community moves towards that character. And so Foucault warned about the postmodern problem where we could get trapped in matrices where we will have ideals and we will self-regulate towards them and they could be hurting us. They could be damaging us. We don't know. We don't know what we're missing out on. And we have to sort of dive into these things and critique them properly and understand that only a hundred years ago, everything was upside down that we hold as moral first principles now. Nietzsche, the same, would say 2,000 years ago, our whole concept of good and evil was literally upside down. And so our idea that we're statically in the place where we've got everything figured out is delusional beyond absolute, un 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 unmeasurable belief. We are most certainly sat within a very, very interesting psychological problem where we've sort of fallen into our first principles and we need to start asking serious questions about them. And this is what we're going to do today. So this idea that we have a centralized figure in the playground, the community, and this centralized ideal figure, this God that hangs over it is what, is what becomes the story that drives all our choices is essential and best described, is best described by looking throughout history, looking throughout how this thing evolved. So I'm going to start with Rome. Now, what we're doing with this channel, you must understand, is we're taking, <laughs> we're taking the... We're taking this centralized character nowadays, which we're very unconscious of, this messiah, and we're trying to turn it into true Pavlovian conditioning. We're trying to turn it into the alert boyo. So the boyo who is reached enlightenment. And so every time one of us, and every time the word boyo alert is said, instantly millions of people across the globe, like maybe even 10% of the population would just snap into like Buddha level, bodhis bodhisattva level enlightenment and be like, I understand, I see everything, I am perfect. And this is this is our way that we'll defeat the the tragedy of original sin and the the in the inconsistency of evolution. We will we will use this magic meme, this super first principle, boyo alert, and that will save everybody, that will redeem everybody from the tragedy of the human race. But before we reach this level, we must do a a noble crusade, which look uh, we are willing to do because we are the good people. You know what we're going to do is we're going to look at how humans, those silly humans of the past, struggled to figure this stuff out that we found so easy. The simple magic mantra of boy alert solved, and that is what what the way the Romans saw all this. So the Romans were interesting in that they were trying to reach for higher standards. Now this is. This can be very, very abstract, but imagine it this way. So you're sitting around with a load of your mates and you just have this habit of eating pizza all, all the time, every day. Every day you eat pizza and uh, you all play video games. And then one day you're like watching YouTube and then you, some, someone actually says, boy alert, and you're like, Phew! I understand. And you say, I must get juicy. And you don't know where this comes from. You get brainwashed by the boy alert. And you're like, I must get juicy. And so you start going, you want to start going to the gym. You start going to the gym. And you, suddenly you stop showing up for like pizza and video games Friday. And all your friends turn around to you and they're like, dude, you've gotten kind of boring. You've gotten kind of pretentious. You've, got a kind of, you've gotten kind of arrogant since you started, you know, you started like stop using English vocabulary and start saying boy alert and going to the gym all the time. So I've, we, we like, what's, what, what is with this, you know? And of course, this is weird because you are trying to do something very good. You're trying to get healthy. This is going to take care of your future, improves your mood. You're trying to raise your standards, you know? And you'd imagine that your friends would be like, fuck yeah. Come on, you. Yeah. Go on, you fucking boy. Oh, yeah. Get you. See yeah. You'd imagine that's what your friends would do, but they don't do that. They turn around and they feel bad because your rising starts to reflect negative of them as the uh, negative on them. As the sun goes up, they they get burned. They're like, I am ugly and fat and lazy, and they're gonna get they're gonna get cool and people are gonna like them more. I had them perfectly boxed in as like you know that guy that I could you know make fun of and he sort of liked me and all that. Now he's trying to he's trying to you know reach for the stars. He's trying to escape. Kill him. Pull him down. Pull him down there. Same with Jesus. Jesus comes in and says, guys, let's let's alert the boils. Let's be let's be more juicy. Enough of this. Enough of this stuck in ignorance and, and sacrificing animals and all this. Let's let's go. Let's go. Let's become more juicy. 
come on, let's do this. And then everybody in Judea goes, kill that guy, fuck that guy. No way. No way are we reaching towards higher standards. And the Romans are in the same position. They were walking around to a world of ignorance, people eating grass, people picking the stuff out from beneath, <laughs> from between their toes, picking the stuff out from between their toes and like eating it and all this and being like, mm, it's great being a, it's great being a, 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 it's great being, it's great being me. God, we're so smart. We're so brilliant. Romans, do you want to go do this? And the Romans are there thinking to themselves, what the fuck is wrong with this place? And as I said, this is important to understand. As I said in the last um, lecture, the last talk, the last, the last bio chat, as we can call it, all of our emotions tend to have a message. And the most interesting emotion is anger, fury, frustration, because anger wants higher standards. That's its message. Now, it's very hard to understand that because you may you think it wants you to punch stuff, but it's actually saying, I want higher standards. I want you to set boundaries, standards, rules, baselines, and I want you to enforce them. I want you to be willing to sacrifice your life to enforce them. Now, that's an incredibly difficult thought because most people aren't willing to sacrifice discomfort to enforce standards. They're not willing to give up and suffer pain it's so they can get like in better shape. They'd rather just keep eating the ice cream like a fool. And so Aries is there. All right, man. All right, man. I am furious. We need higher standards. And the Romans feel this energy in them. They get angry. They're like, we want higher standards. We want something better. The world, humanity can't be about like eating toe, toe fluff. That's not what it is about. It's about something better. It's about something more glorious. And they say it's about civilization. It's about writing. It's about glory, reaching the heights and all that. And so they gather around this fire, this burning will towards something great, which they call Mars, which is the Greek god Ares, which is what we understand as anger, that rootless desire to enforce standards. And they gather around this god, this image, this ideal, this perfect version of themselves, and they build up their playground around that. And they say, right, we're going to worship this. We're going to focus on this is the ideal way to be to have just disgustingly high standards and be willing to die in order to enforce them and allow that fury to, to course through your veins and let it guide you. And they take over the fucking world when they do that. There was something correct about it. Now, this is so difficult for us to understand because imagine this is violence, fury and <laughs> terror. It's, it's a monster. They're literally saying the monster within we are going to let out. And imagine, imagine if you had a politician nowadays, most politicians are like, oh, we're here to be nice, to spread love, to, to do the good thing, to help all the people, to make everybody happy, spread democracy, equality, liber liberty, peace and all this. Imagine if a politician walked out and he was like, right, guys, I am the prophet of violence and anger and fury. <laughs> Let's, our civilization is about fury and a rootlessness and war. <laughs> And this is this is the the accepted this is the ideal mode of being the celebrated mode mode of being for the Romans. Imagine if that showed up nowadays. We need we need a little bit more war in this community, people. We need a little bit more ruthless violence and brutality. We need and you know maybe he'd say higher standards. That that could that could go across all right, but this one would be interesting. So that's what the Romans were doing. The Romans ended up taking over the world doing that, and they. Of course, their, their, their high standards got a little bit excessive. They got a little bit greedy. They started to establish a noble class. And then beneath them, they had this, um, this giant slave class of Urukai. And their community started to evolve a bit because they, they got so big so fast that it became very, very difficult to manage. They're a great study in the challenges of managing stuff like this. These nobles, obviously, they didn't want to work. They wanted slaves. So they started taking in people from everywhere. And then this really destabilized the civilization because the slaves are sort of saying to themselves, what the f why, do, why do these guys, these guys don't do anything. Why do these guys get to work? And so the community became a little bit of a challenge. And so what they, they had to expand on this areas of higher standards because only a few people can benefit from that. And they had to expand on that and they had to say, all right, we need something different. And one of their greatest innovations was the gift of property and land and rights and citizenship through the army. So they said, all right, if you're part of Rome and you serve in the army to honor Rome, we will gift you the privilege of being a part of the Roman Empire and the, the privileges of citizenship and we'll give you property and land and all that, as I said. 
And so what happens is the the central image moves a little bit away from Aries and moves now, now, now towards a more idea of like a disciplined, obedient character who obeys Rome, who works for Rome, who fights for Rome. And this somewhat works. This allows the super huge army to 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 uh, stay 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 regulated and stay working and it allows them to expand even further it also puts a, a essentially a hammer hammer a hammer blow on the final nail in the coffin because that means that the the empire cannot sustain itself unless it keeps growing it's never ending growth or it collapses and that's eventually what happens it gets too big for its boots but that was the uh, big issue with it. it it had this like centralized idea and this centralized idea was um, the disciplined soldier. If you can think of it like Sauron from Lord of the Rings, it's almost like the Urukai, the Urukai who gets pulled out of the ground and he becomes like an obedient member of this Roman Empire, this Roman civilization. And in order to articulate why this is so interesting in contrast to what comes next, we're going to talk about the Germans. Now, what happens is the Romans had a hard time civilizing the Nords, civilizing the Germans. They they took over the Celts. They did a pretty good job there. They smashed them. And um, they always described the Celts as like beautiful, strong, tall, blonde, handsome, like how you'd imagine a male model nowadays, a bodybuilder, like juicy, walking around, very, very good looking and very, very strong and all that, full of energy, full of vital energy. And that's actually how they described these general people of Northern Europe, that they were like almost like super athletes, but they, and they had this like furious power in them, like just abundant health and power and vitality. And their experience of fighting against them was something which they call the Teutonic Fury. Um, it's um, one of the sources for the idea of berserk, going berserk, where we get that idea. And that was where they'd like strip naked. They might dr take some mushrooms or, or drink some alcohol. And they'd or maybe they'd oil themselves up for all we know. And they'd run into battle against these legions, like these giant six foot seven a monster and they cut down like crazy and they'd just be in this fury of blood and violence and terror and so fighting against this would have been absolutely horrific because it was like getting attacked by a giant lion like imagine a man six foot seven when you're like a five foot eleven six foot tall roman you'd be terrified you know you'd never seen anything quite like this and you see you see him take down one of your fellow soldiers and he he literally like i don't know bashes his skull till it's flat or something like that just absolute incredible savagery and so their experience of these characters was terrifying but they they beat them with discipline and order and so there's this very very interesting contrast here because you have um you have these these nords and they are like nearly beautiful nearly ideal individuals but they're disorganized they they fight as a, a kind of mob you know they all run into battle they have no order they have no line and that they clash up against it and one on one they would destroy any Roman soldier. But as a unit, like you see in Leonidas coming against the Persians, as a unit, the Romans can hold very, very powerful rank. Their shields and their their um, big long spears and they, they can put up a serious fight against these powerful people by uniting as one. So despite as being individuals that are these Urukai that are obviously dangerous, but not nothing compared to these these advanced Nords. They, they um, as a unit, are way, way more powerful, and they conquer Gaul that way. But they never quite conquer Germany. They just can't break into Germany, and the Germans can't really break back into them. That's that's a very interesting stalemate. But what you have here is a different conception of the ideal. In the, the German or the, the Nord vision of the community, you have this centralized idea of the beautiful character in the middle, the, the perfect individual. So the Roman would come up and say, listen, right we've built the greatest civilization of all time you're there picking toe dust like we we have roads we have writing we have the roman empire we have prestige we have everybody dressed with some cool clothes like we've got a great thing going here so look join our thing or we'll come and kill you like it's and we're being nice you can join our thing and then the german would turn around and say all right listen here bro all you live in ghettos you know, look at the state he is. You're all eating grain. Whereas me, I run out in the forest. I can kill a boar and eat boar every single day. I can have meat every single day. And um, I'm completely self-reliant. Like if someone cuts off the grain to your big city, you all starve. You don't have any ind individual personality. You all just obey your higher ups. You're like robots. You're like this giant army of slaves. 
I, I like I I am free. I am happy. I'm in touch with nature. I don't have any of this bullshit like learn to write. Like what what use is that? Why well, I'm gonna sit down, bend over, and start scribbling in books? There's that's, that's no use to me at all. I don't care about this. So please, dude, you don't have a good offer. I'm a proud, healthy, and strong individual as it is. And you are a half man coming to me, offering me into your half man empire. So how about no? How about you go fuck off? And if you come back here again, I'm going to kill you. And that's generally what happened. They fought and the Romans did not beat them. And then over time, the Vikings got more organized, got more civilized from in coming in contact with this. They took on the stuff that was useful, the, sorry, the Germa, Germani, and they went down and they actually ended up taking over Rome once Rome burnt itself out. And then they established their kingdom over all of Europe. Now, this becomes interesting because then we can look at what Christianity did. Christianity establishes, establishes itself and creates that idea of that community with that goal, that super character in the middle, that super category, as Foucault said, that thing that orientates everybody towards the, this goal. So the Germans had this almost selfish, proud, individualistic idea. Whereas the, um, and this best described in this area with the contrast between the Vikings and the Christians. So everybody thinks the Vikings are all cool and all that. But if you were like a Christian monk living in a nice Christian community where everybody was nice to themselves and a Viking came in, a Viking came up in his boat, this demonic Teutonic showed up, he would run in and what he would do is he would kick down the door to your church, he would grab all the girls and he would take them and then he would kill you and sacrifice you to Odin on the altar. He would like rip your belly open and you'd be screaming and he'd be like, here you go, pull out your heart and hold it up to Odin on the altar. And then uh, and then he'd like throw it on the picture of Jesus behind him and then roll you off and then go do it to your neighbor or something like that. And so if you're a Christian back then, you're like, what? What, it, what the hell was that? What was that? And then you read your little book and you're like, oh, what the fuck is, well, what just happened here? And you're like, you're reading about this Satan character and then all your priests are telling you, yeah, he has horns and he's like, you know, big, big hairy monster, animal beast. And you're like, that, that was lit. that was Satan. Satan just came and took all my girls. Imagine that. <laughs> imagine that. Like, imagine if it actually happened. You know, people t tell you these stories, but imagine you're sitting there one day and someone, you're going to church and someone's being like, there's this Satan character who lives in the world and he'll come and he'll take all your girls and he'll kill you and he doesn't like your god he doesn't like jesus he hates jesus actually and then you're like yeah whatever <laughs> like you're like one of us one of us moderns and you're like yeah yeah whatever it's all just priests talking it was weirdos it's not true it's all just made up man then a viking shows up a viking shows up and does it and you're like whoa <laughs> well there's there maybe there's something to this concept maybe there's something to it and um, that becomes fascinating because you have these Vikings and they, they essentially can't participate in the b bigger community of Christianity, which has been built over all of Europe. The, the, now, like at this stage, it has Rome and it has France, it has England, it has Ireland. And you've got this massive empire, this massive community, massive community, all centralized in the character of Jesus. And everybody's moving their energy towards this and being like, let's all act like Jesus. And then you have a Viking coming in like, oh, how about I act like uh, Satan, yeah? So everybody's like, no, bro, g g g get out of here. No, not a chance. So a big project becomes, well, we have to civilize these monsters. We have to bring these people into the community. And this is where, and Nietzsche would say, this is where we start to see some type of some type of will to power from the category creators, from the magicians, from the priests. So the priests go into these northern places like the Vikings, like the demonic Teutonics, and they start to try imprint this category of Jesus onto their souls. And they start to try imprint this category of Satan onto their souls, their souls being their inner world. This is a very interesting form of power, but of course the priests couldn't beat them in battle, the Normans took over north of France. The, uh, they established their kingdom all over most of uh, northern Europe as well. They were conquering everywhere. And so the only way that they can be controlled, they can be tamed, they can be brought in to the community was by getting, by taking their minds, by taking their beliefs, by changing their conception of the world. And Christianity is what did this. And look, Nietzsche would criticize against them and many people like would rationalize that, oh, the Christians were evil or the Christians were trying to break them in a, in a negative sense. And all right, fair enough. Like maybe, maybe it's not ideal. Maybe, maybe things could have worked a different way and we'll get into why not later. But think about their reality. They have these monsters, these Satans running in and fucking them up. And... 
everybody thinks that if they were back in the day, they would have been the Vikings. They would have been the, the badass Vikings. And then if the Viking came into, or even if the Viking came into their monastery, they'd be able to be like, wait there, Mr. Viking. I've, I've read Nietzsche. I get it. Like, I understand. Like, I'm cool, man. Don't kill me, man. Don't kill me. And they, the Viking would say, bro, I want your girl. I don't even care about you. And they just kill you anyway and take your girls. That's, that's what it would be about. I don't even know what a Nietzsche is. So please stop with your weird magic spells. So you'd be no exception. And so you'd be terrified of these guys as well. And you'd be thinking to yourself, how do we tame these? We can't fight them. So what do we do? We need to take their minds. We need to break their minds. And the trick there is that the Vikings would have this image in their head of me, of proud individual, Thor, Odin, Baldur, whatever you want. They'd have that conception built onto their soul, which is the healthy, strong individual. And they'd still be seeing these Christians the same way as the ancient Germani would be seeing the, the Romans. You're half men living in this community of this zoo of weakness, and you've all degraded into something ugly and pathetic. You're crouched over in your monastery like a like a little bitch scribbling in your books. And look, I, it's like, I'm just going to go in might is right and take all that gold for myself and take all your girls. What are you going to do with them? Produce more, produce more half men, produce more little hobbits, produce more little dwarfs. I, I'm, I'm the ruler around here. Nature does not reward little bitches like you. I am the real deal. And so that would be their attitude coming into it. And so what happens is the priests eventually get this image of Christ onto their souls. The, the brainwashing works. The, the spreading of the message works. They take them into the community. And then what happens is that old source of power and will to power and Odin or whatever gets replaced by Jesus. Now, this is fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Because what this does to their emotions is where people don't actually articulate this well enough. But this is where the entire the hammer falls and hits the the hammer hits the road. <laughs> Mixing me metaphors like mad there. But you know what I mean? This is where the crux of the argument comes from. So what happened before is that they had this burning desire for higher standards like the Romans did. They had that Ares and their version of that was Odin. Odin was the god of the berserk, of the fury. And so they had that burning desire for, for victory, conquest, battle, Ares, strength. And it shoots up into their body and they hear that and they're like, Odin has come to me. He's speaking to me. Odin is screaming at me. Go, go sail across the ocean and find something. Conquer, conquer, expand. And he'd be, he'd be nearly like, he'd be going insane sitting at home up there in Scandinavia being like, what am I doing here? I need to go out and I need to go get something. I need to go take on the world. I need to go fight. And it would scream at him. And this is his ambition. And he'd listen to it. And it would carry him. And then he'd go out and he'd kill all those priests. And that's why he'd sacrifice to Odin. In this savage, berserk fury, he'd like kill a, rip a priest open or something like that. Or kill a goat or something like that. And that would be Odin's gift. That would be like, I reward this energy that came to me. This, this emotion, I reward it. Because look what you've done for me. You've given me all these riches. You've given me all these chicks now. And so he would see that energy as good. And he would see the disobedience the 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 introversion the the uh, oh, i'm not sure if i should obey that energy or not oh that emotion oh i don't know oh, I, I'm, I'm not sure uh oh god what if something bad happens what if i go out and, and the ocean and and my ship sinks what if i go fight in the monastery and something bad happens that doubting voice that that introspection that that uh, overthinking mind he would consider that evil because what happens is when odin screams at you in order to be courageous, you often have to give yourself over to it, to the risk, to, to not knowing what's going to happen. You have to give yourself to it. And so you have to do the opposite of what that little timid, introverted, scared voice does, which is doubt, question and all that. And so you would see that as evil. You would see that as bad, as the, the sign of a coward. And so you would go off and take that massive risk and fly out to Scand and fly out of Scandinavia to England and Ireland or northern France. And you'd have maybe your brother at home and be like, oh, you're, something bad's going to happen. Something bad's going to happen. You go and you get all the girls, get all the wealth. And you'd come back and you'd look at your brother and be like, you're, you're pathetic, bro. Look what happened. Look what happened when I went for it. Believe in yourself more. Listen to Odin. Odin believes in you. Listen to that fire inside you and it will guide you. Now, then Christianity comes along and Christianity gives them Christ and Christ sits on top of that doubting, confused, scared, hesitating mind. And Christ becomes the imprint on that. And Christ is good. So that introverted thinking, reasoning, scared mind becomes the symbol for good. 
And that's what the priest is, the, the, the person writing the big book, explaining what he believes about the world and, think, and overthinking everything and, 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 and scared of taking action and, and decides, no, 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 I won't, I won't do that because that's bad. No, I won't, I, won't go, I won't go attack people. That's, that's horrible. No, something bad might happen if I do that. The, 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 the introverted, overthinking priest, the intellectual, the man of the book. And then that fire that screams out at the priest, it's like higher standards. He's the priest sees the beautiful girl and it's like, go get her. Do whatever it takes to have her. Go get that wealth. Do whatever it takes to be powerful, to be strong. No, this, this monastery, this isn't for you. Go, go escape. Go find the open plains. Go find a battle. Go discover who you are. And then this, this, this voice underneath gets framed as Satan. That will, that desire, those screaming voices, they're evil. They're trying to hurt you. They're, they're, that's literally the voice of an evil force that owns the world. And this, this hesitation, this intellectual rationalization, that's good. And that conscience, if you will, that's good. And that becomes the thing. And so when they get that inside the German, suddenly Odin's voice is now reframed as Satan's voice. And the German, the Nord, turns against himself. And so you can see that magnificent switch, that perfect inversion. You had that glorious good and that centralized idea of what it meant to be good, which was the courageous follower of Odin, has now been swapped around to the hesitating, conscience-obeying Christian, the follower of Christ. And that integrates them into the whole community. And again, Nietzsche's like, all right, you can see why they had to do that, the priests, because they were getting attacked by these fuckers and these guys were running in and destroying their books and destroying all their work. It was impossible to cultivate higher civilization with these guys around. So they had to use their power to do this. And the simple virtue of this is a more advanced version of power than violence is the reason why it wins. This is the correct way to think. This is the correct way to deal with the world, to attack the world. Magic works better than war. And so this is why the priests won. And that's an amazing thought. And such a more rational and nuanced understanding of how this stuff went down. Because people come into this and they're like, well, it was good versus evil. And there's a black and white way of looking at this. Please walk away from the table. Adults are trying to talk here. This stuff seems sophisticated and difficult to understand. And of course, if we look at how our emotions work, this seems to make the most sense. How did people in the past act this way? They weren't just all Satan. You know, and Christianity wasn't just like this total, total like cuck religion. There was there was logic to why it went down this way. And so Nietzsche looks at this and says, all right, this, so this Christendom thing took over and we can see why it took over. But it has a black and white understanding of emotions. And there's danger in that because those Nords, all their power came from all their creative power came from that burning desire for higher standards that Aries that Odin that was good that was objectively good because that's what is the creative part of humanity and this stuck in your head overthinking introverted insanity of the 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 niggling conscience voice in the back of your head most certainly that's useful perhaps in taming Odin, but if we take a black and white approach and just say that's good, no, it's definitely not. That destroys a person. That's actually mental illness usually, like what we call a voice and when someone's overthinking stuff too much. You can get so much further if you just look at your basic instincts. I talked in the last video. If you just pick five fears and just go for those, you'll improve your mental health a thousand times more than if you like think everything true and pay too much attention to your mind. Your mind is a, your mind has been conditioned not to do its job very, very cleanly or very, very holistically. Now, that's fascinating because this is coming from 2,000 years of Christianization. And this is Nietzsche's warning. It's like, all right, something serious happened there because this one, this Christianization won and it implanted this introverted, overthinking character on all of our souls. And so he looked at the modern German, like you'll notice when you read Nietzsche, he sort of seems like he hates the Germans. And he's, he's a little bit pissed off of them. It's like, how did you fall for this? Look what you've become. You, ha you used to be these like monsters roaming around that were like, like we, you read the accounts and they literally look like bodybuilders, uh, just great examples of supreme power. And these guys are walking around now and they're all stuck in monasteries 
um, expressing, like warring with their, their inner inner instincts and they, they, they distrust themselves, they hate themselves, they've gone a little bit insane. And so he's saying to them, he's saying to us, all right, well, Christianity took, took us over, but we, it can't be, this, this can't be the end. This can't be the final goal. This can't be the conclusion that we just castrate all our instincts and that leads us to salvation or something like that. It doesn't seem sophisticated enough for us to understand. And so this is where we have to start getting into the dangers of what Christianity did. Now, what happens when you have an ideal at the center of the community, as we said, within the playground, within the matrix, as Foucault said, is that this ideal starts to become the centralizing mor moral uh, compass for all of the behaviors. And so people start to self-regulate. So when you have Odin, everybody says things like Odin are good. So when you're courage, courageous, like Ares or Odin, they're like, that's very good. That's good. And that's what the Roman religion was like. And that's what the Norse pagan religion was like. Then when you put Christianity inside of it, it's like everything that's like, like what we consider Jesus to be is good. So you have people acting more introverted, acting, hunching over, writing books in monasteries, being timid, turning the other cheek and all this stuff, that becomes good. That becomes what we want. That's yes. Oh yeah, that's very, very good. That's the best. I love you for that. That's all very, very good. And so the community self-regulates. And what happens is then is that, that that abstract ideal becomes the model that everybody in the community slowly evolves towards. Now that's difficult for us to conceptualize because we live only short lives in the context of history. But 2000 years of that, that radically changes the species. If you imagine that you have a a beautiful wolf, two communities of beautiful wolves, and one community gets taken over by humans. And so what happens is the human says, well, I want this cute, kind, fluffy pet that I can touch and all this. So what will happen is the, 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 human, the humans will take this community of wolves and it will breed out the ones with sharp fangs, with aggressive instincts. It will breed it towards something that's nice and chilled. And so you would get like the common house pet dog that's a little bit of a cook. And it might even start castrating the dog because it doesn't want too many babies. And so over time, you'll have this little like little, little terrible little weak dog that's like kind of funny and small. And if you threw that dog out in the jungle, it would get eaten alive. But obviously, you're never going to need that because it's a house pet. So it's this little timid coward dog, but it's it's cute. No, oh, the cute coward dog. And then you have these other wolves and they stay out in nature. And of course, nature's the one dictating. Nature's the playground here. And nature has a very specific demand and that's absolute savage excellence. And so no matter what happens, the, 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 the cute dogs die and the ruthless, horrific, strong dogs win. The wolves win. And so what happens is the ideal among the wolves, very unconsciously, remains the, you know, juicy, chad, supremely good hunting wolf. And so we think, like, we would obviously never want to be around such a wolf because it'd be so dangerous. We're like, oh, God, oh, I don't want to be in a room. I don't want to be anywhere near that, that, that wolf. That wolf is that's a, that's a horrific wolf. That would eat me in a second. That's evil. But you'll notice that people love and like in a different type of love, they love the dog because he's nice and cute and, and, and chilled and all that. But they, they revere the wolf as almost divine because it's this example of something beautiful. Now, that's fascinating because the dog is cute. The dog is chilled out. You can kind of hug it and touch it and all that. But the wolf is majestic. The wolf is a force of nature. And that tinge, that immensely large tinge of danger is actually gives it some type of aura. It's a savage from the wild. It's a beast of some sort. And so despite the fact we never want to be around one of those, because it's almost like, it's like the Viking. It's, it's majestic, dangerous, horrific, but also somewhat beautiful from a distance. But you don't want to be anywhere near that. And so you can see how the image in both of these dictates evolves these animals towards what they have been. Uh, dogs, used to be related to wolves, I believe. So you have, you can see how this actually happens over a long period of time. Our conception of what we want out of the wolf turns it into a dog. Now there's a hor horrible, horrible, scary danger to this. Two, two things, first of all, we are absolutely no exception to this process. 
our ideals, the playground that we have and the ideal character within the middle of the playground is most certainly what we are moving towards. Our community and our goal in the middle is what we get pushed towards by ourselves. We self-regulate towards this. It's not necessarily that there's like some supreme ruler over the whole thing, the way we think of it. There's no like one king that's put all of this stuff and that's planned all this stuff out. It's almost like the memes are guiding us. Now, then as well, there's, there's a danger from being too cute. What happens is, the best example of this is the pug. Check out the pug, right? Um, you have a pug, I have a, I have a relative who loves pugs, and the, the, her pugs keep dying, and they don't live as long as other dogs, because they're all, it's almost like they've been selectively bred to not be adapted to reality properly. They have those squished up faces, so they can't really breed properly, and that gives them heart problems. And that's sort of a, they were selectively bred to be cute, to be fun and all that. But this makes them sort of abominations of life. They're somewhat ugly. There's sort of something wrong with them. Like, why should they, they shouldn't exist. There's, there's, like, if you threw them out in the forest, they get, like, a wolf would sit there and just get this giant bowl and put all the pugs in it and eat them with a fork. Like, they're not right. They're not, and they're not noble. And it's, it's, it's like, here's something you have to think. I know they're cute and I know it's nice to have them around, but is it fair for us to create an animal that suffers so? Like a wolf lives a horribly hard life. He sleeps out in the cold, but he's probably happy. He's probably healthy. He probably feels great. It's probably a, a, a brilliant to be, I'd love to be reborn as a wolf. But a pug, a pug is there like comfortable, but he has a bad heart. He can't breed properly. His life is probably an immense amount of suffering. His instincts don't work properly. He doesn't. He's d digging on the floor because he 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 doesn't feel right. Something in him is like you're not in. You're in a box. You're not in. You're not in nature. You're not where you should be. And he actually suffers. And so our desire for the cute thing is cruel in a very strange way. The cruelty of parody of life or something like that. Whereas the wolf, despite the absolute pain and abject desolation of nature and the rootlessness of nature is a very proud and noble animal and has has a lot of has has very has very little relative suffering and that's an interesting idea and so our danger is that we get together and we pick an ideal or we unconsciously pick an ideal and it moves the human race which was once all you know Aries Romans and uh, Odinic Germans and like strong and healthy beings in touch with nature and we're moving towards something that's cute, that's that's useful for the context of the big machine, the big community, the big playground, as the Romans needed to do. They needed to create this sort of generalized, useful automaton. And the same with Christianity. Christianity, in civilizing people, reduces them down into half-men, makes them more like pugs. It makes them more tame, right? And this is where we get this brilliant quote from Nietzsche when he says, the great epochs of our life come from when we have the courage to rebaptize our badness as the best in us. That thing that we hated about the Vikings, which was their ruthlessness, was actually coming from this, this deep burning desire in their Odinic belly for higher standards. And it was the source of their creativity. Every great artist has had this almost irrational desire for beauty and majesty and greatness. And it's, it's almost like a, a sign of health. And the wolf is full of that. And he's, he's got an abundant will to power. And likewise, the, the artist has the same. He has this shining out will to power. He's like, I want to create. I need to create. I need to ignore everybody and reach for something beyond, reach for something greater. And so if we were to talk about generally, yes, of course, it's nice to have a lot of cute people around or else we can't just introduce Vikings into the zoo. But we have to think very, very carefully about what's happening because Christianity created the zoo that we're in, created the playground that we're in and has set us on a destiny, a path, has built into us a set of memes that are now ruling us that we, that no one's in control of. These memes are the things that are walking us forward. And um, we need to ask ourselves, well, where are these memes bringing us? What if they're bringing us towards the pug? And that's the most serious question you could ever ask. It may not seem serious, but in 200 years, if the bulk of humanity is all pugs, 
you're not going to be around to take responsibility for it, but the entire project of human history, all those deaths and all that suffering and all that striving will be over. For example, testosterone is plummeting right now. What happens if IQ starts plummeting because we're not doing this properly? What happens if that happens? What are we going to do about that? And you're going to, you might moralize now and be like, blah, 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 this is what I think. But, but are you going to take the responsibility for what happens if things go wrong? Because this is a serious conversation, you know? Like, imagine God. Imagine God sitting up there and he says, all right, I'll create these monsters, you know, these beautiful wolves all around. He says, I'll create nature, the little playground, and I'll drop in this little life energy and it'll turn them all into beautiful beings. I'll go for a nap, I'll come back and then I'll see see where they're at and I'll, I'll try fix them or whatever. And he goes for his big, long, million-year nap and then he comes back and then every, everybody's a pug. And he's like, what did you do? Like, are you serious? I, I, literally, I literally went for one nap and you're all, you're all like tiny little weak bitches. What did you do? How did this happen? <laughs> Jesus. And then he'd have to go back to the drawing board and start again. And so think about that. This is what this is an inertia of history that has been baked into us for about 2000 years and that we're moving towards without question. Nietzsche would say despite the fact that we're not Christian now, we still follow all of its memes. And there's there's a great argument for that. And so at the center, the most important thing for us to ask is actually that Foucault question. All right, we have this community, we have this playground, what is the image in the middle? So this puts us in the place to ask the most serious question we could ever ask. But first, we have to do two things. We have to talk about why Christianity set us up for this and why that could be. It's, it's inevitable. We can't, go, we can't go back to paganism. We can't go radically. We can't go radically back to Christianity either. Because the forces of history have decided that we are on a certain path and we must adapt to our reality as it is. Christendom prepared us for this, and this is this is another myth we got to dispel about the Ubermensch is that it's it's not about like some you know Chad, fucking you know master morality Roman walking around like Odin or something like that. That's not that's not how things are going to play out. Nietzsche is saying that Christianity took us in and it stuck us into our head and tamed us and made us very very good at at um, disobeying. Our emotions. So these these is Odin, Odinic Vikings, and this these Roman Ares followers, these Mars followers. They, when their emotions came up, it was almost like a rule that they had to obey them. The Christians come in with their unnuanced view, where they're saying just destroy that at all costs, destroy their instincts, and so they they cut out their instincts, and then that eventually turns them in, turns the average human into a pug. It sets them against themselves. They, they they sit down all the time, become scribes, and they destroy their posture, become smaller men, they become half men. But Christianity gave us this ability now to tame our instincts. So we're, we're able to disobey it or obey it if we want. And so we're now in a new place where there's this sort of regulating power over our instincts. We've got this discipline over it. But Nietzsche would say, all right, the next step we have to take, we have to look at what Christianity did. It unified this huge vista of people under this common ideal, and it gave them the power to turn off their instincts. Now we just need to take the more sophisticated view that, okay, instincts are not Satan. Instincts are the source of our power, but they're not exactly smart either. They're sort of dumb and stupid. We, like, you know, you can't just walk around being a Viking anymore. You read stories about the Vikings, and it's like... The, the Kevian Roos, for example, look up voices of the past and you read about what they did and they, they, were, they, were, they were pretty uncivilized people in a negative sense. Like they, they were dirty, they were unhygienic, they, they were just kind of crazy and they did, their, their funeral rites were like pretty mad and whatnot. And I don't think, like you can't just go back to that stuff. You can't just let the instincts and get pulled around by them. They, there's no logos to that. There's no intelligence to that, you know? So we are in a position where we can do something intelligent with our instincts but we also have to push back against the Christian conception, which is your instincts are evil. We need to say, okay, our instincts are good, but we must channel them. That's the sophisticated nuance. And I say the, the, the new way we must understand this stuff. This is probably the next paradigm we need to push on this because people still haven't caught up to this at all. And so if we were to do that, what would happen? We'd say, well, if we could let our Odin Aries creativity burst out of us, allow our instincts to shine, allow our will to shine, but we also channeled it, 
we could set a goal with that. We could say, all right, well, what are we going to create? What are we going to do with the world? What are we going to do with ourselves? So we have this community and we need to focus. We're trying to focus our instinct on creating something, on doing something. So we need to ask ourselves, all right, what's the, what's the person we want to shape? What's the person we want to create? What's the image we want to put on top of that? Because as we said, if you control the categories, you control the community. And so far, we've just allowed this control to happen unconsciously. And this is the danger of Christianity in that it says, oh, you're not allowed to ever try to take responsibility for things yourself. And it's like, all right, cool. But you've, th this is... Look, you need to give a better justification for why we can't than just, uh, I'm scared Satan. You know, these things are, the force of the forces of history have pushed us into a new place where we, we could say perhaps competent people are able to do this job well. And so we have to ask serious questions. So the question becomes, what would be ideal in the middle? Now, the good argument against Christianity is that it makes people sick by shoving them in their heads and against their instincts. It destroys what is life about them what is vital about them and you may think oh well you know that was odin that was vikings that was satanic and all that but life and vitality is what heals you health is more connected to vitality and life than we ever want to admit we probably have a bad view about this so perhaps the first thing we need to do is get a correct view about what health is what life is what happiness is what these this type of feeling is the wolf is happy because it's full of vitality despite the fact that it lives in snow. The pug is not happy despite the fact that it lives in a absolute cushion-filled glorious chamber. There's something wrong with the pug. If the pug had a mind to conceptualize itself, it would be going through an immense amount of identity crisis. It dies young as well. It's, it's an ugly being. And it's, it's horrible to do that to something. It's not, it's not right. As much as you'd say, oh, well, I'm a good person. If, you, if, the, if the fruit from your tree is this little pug, you are not the good person. You are an irresponsible person who was too willing to moralize as opposed to think logically or, or at least admit that you don't know what you're talking about and allow other people to think for you. And so there's this serious issue because... If we model what is health, it's tied to vitality. If we could create people who are strong, they are way more naturally resistant to things like diseases, way more naturally resistant to things like depression and and and, and all those type of things. We know that gen all, a lot of this stuff is genetic. So how do we craft a people who are strong and healthy? How do we put health and excellence as the ideals that we're moving towards instead of this pug existence, instead of this lower existence that destroys us? And so if we could get that category straight and say, this is exactly what we want. We want people, we want people to be healthy and strong and fit and health and, and happy. We want people to feel good. Now, of course, there could be dangers about this. Like it could make them a little bit more wolf-like, a little bit more crazy. But we have to get the first principle in, in place so that we can start moving towards this and be like, how do we do this safely? How do we do this where we civilize the wolves and maybe turn them into something akin to a greyhound as opposed to, you know, just everybody becomes a Viking again. It'd be like, all right, well, how will we, we, we turn them into greyhounds where they stay on track? They're not running around like eating the audience. They're like racing, but they're still very healthy and strong and whatnot. How do we do that? And that's where we start thinking very clearly. And this is what the Ubermensch is. This is what it is. It's a category focused on health opposed to focused on death. And this is why Nietzsche says a lot, or focused on pugness. This is why Nietzsche constantly says we need to be very, very careful. I, this, sorry, the metaphor that keeps carrying through this spoke of Arathustra is rising life versus going down. So there is definitely this problem where whatever Christianity has instantiated into us with its category, it's pushing us downwards. It might not necessarily be Christ himself or Christianity itself, but it's it's project to civilize has now instantiated us a set of ideals, a set of memes that are now controlling us. No one's controlling and are now controlling us and driving us downwards. And these gods, whatever they are, they're they're almost like the gods of death. And it's like we're possessed by them. It's a scary thought. Christianity would get in this idea of anti-instinct, anti-instincts and rationality and shoved in your headness. And that becomes a, a god over 2,000 years. And now, even though we've, we've gone anti-Christian, we've forgotten about religion, that god still sits up there. And so we're still 
shoved in our head and it's, we're still anti-instincts and we're so we're slowly becoming more and more pug-like and it's going to get worse it's going to start snowballing at some point and we need to this is what Nietzsche called the last man we're snowballing towards that dangerous place and we need to stop and be like whoa guys whoa whoa look at the state of what's going on we're so unconscious of what's happening and everyone's walking around like moralizing and all this we need to take a step back and get serious people asking serious questions about these serious problems and so this is it. Well, what if we move towards excellence and health? Because that's what heals people. As much as people want a virtue signal, it's like, oh, that's bad. Well, it's like, what? Are you against healthy people? Is that is that what you're against? You're against people being healthy, happy, and strong. Well, look, I'm not buying into your little religion there, brother. I'm not buying into your little worldview there, brother. You can go you can go rant on about whatever you want to rant on, but how about over here we're talking about people who are vital? We're actually unideological. We're saying, look, believe whatever you want to believe that the world looks like, but we just want people to be strong, healthy, fit, juicy, um, alert like boyos. That's what we're looking for. And this is what the Ubermensch is. It's that conception of what would that be like and how do we model that as the ideal category and then what will happen is the community will self-regulate towards that so it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to be like a tyrannical enforcement from you know some type of beast of some sort like if we can just get the category shining strong enough it should do most of the work itself and that's a fascinating idea and it's a lot it's like based it's backed up by a lot of what Foucault said and just to end just to f conclude on all these random thoughts. And, and, and I, I guess in some way I didn't really talk about the Ubermensch too much, but there's not a, not a lot to know apart from that, th this context, because that's what sets it up. And um, what that would look like, what that could be centered on, there's just some cool synchronicities, if you will. For example, uh, we did this, this series on Ion. Now, the Greeks discussed Ion as the idea of the beautiful youth. And Ion was also the same, related to the word uh, eternity, um, where we get that idea of living forever. And Ion is also related, like the way that Ion is expressed is the word era. Now, that's actually related to something akin to life force. For example, all of us get gifted some life force. We get gifted an Ion. You can call it a generation, if you will for a period of our life and it's like that life force that Aries that instinct spills out of us and then when it's over it's gone and that's the experience of most people you're young you're beautiful you're healthy you're strong and then you burn out and then you die and you, you actually become old and for a while you don't really have as much ion as you did when you're longer you can call it juice if you want you can call it boyo juice if you really want and so you have this this ion this boyo juice and for example uh, in the I believe it's called the Odyssey Odysseus is um crying i believe and he's crying out his ion is the expression this is um erwin edinger talks about he's crying out his ion so he has this life energy and when he has this real passionate experience he's pouring out part of his life energy and so you know if you had a lot of passionate experiences you'll burn yourself out eventually you only get so much of that stuff and so that's like your will to power you know that's the similar idea that instinct and we get gifted this portion of instincts and in some sense the view we have to have is that there's we have to take careful consideration about what we do with that we have to just deploy it intelligently we can't just you know as we've said before we can't just like spread ion all over the curtains we can't just juice everywhere we need to be like all right how do we channel the juice how do we put ourselves on the straight and narrow of some sort and this is tied into the idea of youth which is fascinating ion is represented as a beautiful youth this is brilliant because the way that like in this world there's this giant universe we live in and there's this force of entropy that's trying to slowly kill everything and there's this really weird anomaly 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 called um called life which is anti-entropic which defeats entropy it's it's like light it just doesn't it doesn't really fit it doesn't make sense it like the universe is a dark dying constantly dying place everything dies buddha noticed this he was like fuck bro looked around and everything's everything's losing its juiciness and dying and decaying and it's coming for all of us but there's something in us that's not us that comes to us for the start of our lives makes us strong and healthy and beautiful allows us to, ex to, to defeat entropy almost effortlessly. It's very easy to be healthy and strong once you've got it. And then it, it, it fades from you and then you die. But what's amazing is that when you look around, when you're old, you see your grandchildren and they have the same. And you know that this new, this life, this ion is theirs. And there's something so, there's something super intelligent about it in that it is instinct. 
its life instinct. It's able to defeat death because it always has. In that eternal war, it keeps winning. It's incredible and it keeps growing. It keeps winning more and more and more. And if we're to be on anybody's side, we should be on that thing's side. Because this is the thing that makes people healthy and strong. Like if you look, like if you look and stop listening to what people say and look what people do, people love youth and beauty. They actually hate it because they don't have it. But, you know, like beautiful girls, young, beautiful girls, beautiful, beautiful boy. I was like, that's, that's, that's the, it's almost like cathartic to people to see stuff like that. It's, it's just so amazing. It's like, thank God that stuff exists in the world because it'd be an ugly place without it. And life has that power. It creates, it can create the beautiful wolf. In some sense, we just need to get out of the way with our reason, because there's a very, very interesting thought. That force of entropy manifests in thousands of different ways. How do we know that force of entropy isn't one of the memes that is controlling us right now? Could be. And so if you're, despite how good you sound, despite how much you reason as to how good you are, as to how right you are, if you're supporting that, you're not a good person. You're supporting death. You're, 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 you're playing the game with death. Nietzsche points to this with religions that are nihilistic, like Buddhism, like he says, Christianity. It's like, at root, these, these things are going against life. They hate life and they're destroying life. And so pick your side carefully. And this is, there's, there's so much more to this. And then I talked about that category of the Messiah at the start. That category of the Messiah at the start always represents to us mythologically as light. You see with Jesus, he has a halo around him. Now that's fascinating because you could argue that Jesus is quite a tragic, sad figure. He died, a figure of the water. But then when you see him represented um, later around about the Renaissance, he starts to become this like figure of light. He's like the son of some sort, son of God, you know? And he has the... Uh, halo around him and the light shining out of him and he, he, he like he was he was from the middle east so he probably had like dark hair dark features but you see him like show up with blue eyes and blonde hair and he's he's like all dressed in white and he's like a light god of some sort and that's um that's the way that archetype gets represented that's the way that centralized sa savior figure gets represented because that's what the sun does you have a world of darkness and then you have these little good people and they're all around this little fire getting some type of sustenance of this 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 heat this light and then the sun comes up and absolutely demolishes all entropy and evil this one figure this tiny figure and it's like you know that circle in the middle of the sky and it saves everybody and it's strong and it's healthy and that's what we all look towards we're like that's that light that power that anti-entropic that anti-darkness that anti-death power the the ever conquering sun the the rejuvenating power of light and youth it always comes up this is our savior and so everybody we find great like jesus is most certainly a powerful uh, redeemer of the soul we, we we project onto him that savior power that power of the of the light and the sun and what i find fascinating about my dreams is that i i think i go to the top of the mountain and i find like solar boyo and that's the same energy it's like it's it was almost showing me that archetypical slot it's like solar boyo is like the 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 divine masculine shining energy full of juice ultimate juiciness and then it's got ion in there as well and the romans would have had apollo and as i said before there's this interesting connection between this apollyan shining clarity of vision and this is i guess what we're sort of saying and the attitude towards and like people are like oh we can't just reason out the ubermensch and all that uh, like apollo we can't just sit there like apollo and be like this is what the ubermensch is and like draw a picture of him we we need to sort of go into our instincts a little bit and so if we go into our dionysian instincts and ask us well what is this character going to be like this is what i'm saying lead let's ask what healthiness what we what we instinctively love what we adore as excellence what really heals us and you'll find things like beauty health strength excellence high goals you'll notice that in this world despite the fact that we have everything people will will leave their comfortable house and go live in a desert in order to work for elon musk because he's talking about something excellent and big i'm gonna conquer mars we want big dreams. We don't want comfort. We don't want to be pugs. We don't want to be that. We want excellent, huge, big ideas. And we want beauty. We want health. We want grandeur. And this is what our souls crave for. And so in some sense, if we are to be serious, we must talk about how we serve that. And this is what the Ubermensch 
is to us. Oh, and I must say that there's actually more I must talk about. I am not finished yet, so I am going to add more to this as well. This may turn out to be a long one, so forgive us, boys, but it's all juice. That's what's important. It's a extended ion, shall we say. Ion extended edition. Now, um, what we're talking about here is the concept of this centralized thing that holds the community together, and that centralized thing is the messiah, the hero, the savior, the whatever. Now, I'm trying to come at this from a non-ideological perspective, because what people will tend to do is be like, no, it's supposed to be this person in the middle, it's supposed to be this, it's supposed to be this, it's supposed to be whatever. Um, what I'm trying to do is the, the Jungian, strictly something that Jung did, and people don't like this, but I, I think this is beyond genius when you understand this without getting too woo-woo about it, in that if you look cross-culturally, there's these sort of meta-patterns that s show us that there's like slots that you need to fill with a symbol. And these would be these would be what he calls the archetypes, you know, and that's these these archetypes could be argued to be sort of like the geometry, the mathematics of psychology, which is an, an amazing innovation because mathematics allows us to be more predictively accurate. This gives us better tools for dealing with something that's very usually very, very emotionally um, reasoned from, which is how the human mind works. Now, what I'm essentially saying is that this certain archetype in the middle, this this savior archetype has this energy that it brings, like when you're, you know, solar on top of the mountain you feel like the sun is shining down and you sort of psychologically and you you get in contact with your power and that's the same feeling that you have when you're in the presence of christ or in the presence of apollo for a roman or i'm sure the prophet muhammad has similar things of like this shining um light power and you see it cross culturally and like all oh, their their messiahs so what's really important to understand about this is that um it doesn't really matter your take on it like the slot is what matters, as long as the slot is filled. The way you can imagine this is, let's go with that music metaphor again. Most people believe that it's supposed to be a certain genre of music, but it's more important that you hit the note. It doesn't matter if you hit the note with Islamic Sufi music or Christian choir music or American R&B music or some weird type of like mad European pagan music where you're getting all down with the drums and all that. It doesn't matter. It, it, it just matters that you hit the note and that will usually psychologically organize people. That's a crazy thought. And I think this is what Jung was leaning towards. Just, just he was saying that you can't just, you can't just like suddenly, you know, if you grow up in Europe, you can't just become a Indian Rajas singer. Like that, that doesn't work. You need to actually be connected to your roots in some sense. So there's, there's that restriction in it as well. You need to understand who you are. You can't like pretend you're someone you're not. That's the other side of it as well. And so what I'm, what, what the Ubermensch is so fascinating in that it takes that entire story of of Europe and it pushes it a step further and says, all right, well. We can't, we can't pretend, we can't go back to European paganism. We can't go back to believing that the earth is flat and God is above it and that's how Christianity works. We can't go back to that. We can't back to medieval times. We can't go back to paganism. We can't go back to, um, we can't go over to India and we all become like uh, Buddhists. Like we just can't do that. We need to do something new. And he's like, well, we have to be creative. And his fear, as I said earlier, was that Christianity puts a restriction saying you cannot come up with new ideas. And he's like, look, if we're going to go extinct, if we're going to destroy, if, if you're going to fall apart, if it's going to fall into wars, maybe maybe your solution is not good enough and we need a new solution. So this is his challenge and it's a brilliant challenge. Now, that slot that we're talking about, that slot where you put in the middle, which is the, the, the divine voyo, if you will, the messiah, the savior, the redeemer, whatever, the hero, the, the juicy, the juicy chad beast the juicy chad beast that can also be and second layer on top of it it's interesting you can have something called the divine child now this this archetype this slot is absolutely fascinating because as i said when you are thinking about this messiah it gives you this power this this feeling of the sun this feeling of um i can do anything that's the sort of experience of it when you think of christ Christ can literally conquer death. You're like, yeah, with Christ, I can do anything. You think of Apollo or Solar Boyo, it's like this super strong beast that is able to like climb the mountain. And you're like, I can do anything. I can climb any mountain. Same way um, how probably Thor would have sat in the, the Odinic situation or Kukulin. It's like this, this divine force of strength. Hercules, another one. 
And you think of that and it has that power of light. Achilles it has that power of light and you're like, I can do anything. That's the feeling it has. And that's just like raw will, raw power. And it's not even in a negative sense. It's actually an inc incredibly healthy, noble and good thing. Everybody should experience that from time to time in their life. Anybody who tells you otherwise is is like, they're, they're not your friend. They're trying to make you weak. You know, it's good to feel strong. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing evil about feeling empowered and strong. And so um, the divine child has that amazing ability to give you a similar type of feeling, only it's more like hope. It's like Frodo or it's like uh, Jesus Christ again. This is where it gets interesting. Christ can be that that shining sun power, but he can also be the, the divine child in the arms of Mary. And it's interesting. We're coming up to Christmas now. What happens with Christmas is that you get the old pagan idea of the sun dying and being born again, the sun redeeming itself. And that's also the rebirth, the idea of new birth again. And then what we have on top of that is Jesus Christ representing both the mature power of the sun and this moment when he is born and he, is, he sets in his destiny to become the mature power of the sun. And so you have in this little symbol, the Messiah, the Savior, the archetype, the divine child, all of it, because the power, the juiciness, the sun shining, the strength of the warrior is what guarantees the future. And the future is tied to the idea of children. And if you establish a guaranteed future, then you have you, you have something to give your children. But if you have, if it's all war and desolation, there's nothing you can do for your kids. And this is where it becomes interesting. This note, this divine child, does, we can't hit it. Not hitting that note is related to a story. So if you believe that it's going to be nothing but war and desolation for a hundred years, you're going to be less likely to want to have kids. And I'll actually back this up by showing you how it's happening to us now in a bit. But if you are sure that you can establish a thousand year Roman Empire, you'll be like, well, I probably should have a couple of kids, you know, <laughs> like you know, keep 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 the old genetics around like that's that's well worth doing. Stability and certainty in the future is actually the platform which gives you hope for children and whatnot. And children themselves have that power to rejuvenate your spirit and say there will be a future. They guarantee the future. Their ion, their their next dose of youthful energy. It's run. I've it's it's I've lost my juice or my juice is running out now and I'm becoming old. But these people are coming up and wow, they're so invigorated. This actually happens in myth a lot as well with the idea of um, old orders transforming into new orders. So you have Kronos, who's like, it's like the boomer and he's eating all the babies. He's eating all the babies and he's having all his babies. And he's like, he's heard a prophecy that the babies are going to take his kingdom. And he's like, no, that's not, I don't want to grow old. I don't want that to happen to me. So all the, the little baby, the Olympians get born and he's like, om nom nom. And then his wife is like, all right, fuck this. And she gives him a stone. And he, he coughs in the stone. And she's like, you fucking idiot. And he pukes up um, everybody. And she hides Zeus. Instead, she gives the stone instead of Zeus. And then Zeus comes in. The divine child, like the sun, against this old, decrepit, stale. What happens is Kronos at one point was like Zeus. And he created a beautiful kingdom. And he was the juicy boyo. And then over time, he got stale. His ion ended. His era, his era in the sun ended. And now he, he's, he's doing what the, the dark side of old age is. And he's like Saturn. Kronos is Saturn. And he clutches and he's like, no, I want to keep what I have. And he gets stale and he gets ugly and uh, monstrous. It's the danger of old age. He gets jealous. He hates youth because he doesn't have it. And then Zeus has to come in as the juicy young lad and smash him and kick him out and establish the new order, the Olympians. And then actually what happens in Greek myth is the same problem happens. Zeus is establishes his kingdom but then over time he reveals that he's becoming a little bit um a little bit mean towards the humans because he's afraid of them overtaking him he won't give them technology he lets them live in darkness because he's afraid that then they'll become like us become like the gods so what happens is prometheus steals fire from the olympians gives it to the humans and then they do become like gods then zeus's era is over fascinating stuff and that's the rejuvenation of the divine child the culture hero the savior all these type of things it's all centralized in this thing and then um, when you do not believe in the divine child blah, 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 i'm talking so fast when you do not believe in the divine child you do not believe in the future and so this this divinity this child is the guarantee of the future now where we sit as a people is that we actually we this we're not hitting this note whatever culture whatever genre of music we're creating right now we're not hitting this note and that may be a strange thing to say but I, there's plenty of evidence to show it like fertility rates are going down and um, that's coinciding with testosterone and uh, arising in mental health issues and all this because the the belief in the future is the thing that heals our pain and the belief in the future is usually represented as the child it's amazing how all this stuff works together and so 
in Warrior, Magician, Lover, King, they, 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 the dudes were explaining that, all right, um, we took in a load of lads and they were all, <laughs> a load of lads, like, and they're all in their 40s and they were explaining how they were jaded with the world. And so what we did is we showed them, we went through those things one by one, you know, we just spoke to all the gods, we went through the things one by one and we, we solved their problems, we got them to believe in the future again. And then when that happened, they, they found hope. And what they started to do is dream of little kids. And then alongside that dream of little kids came the emotion of hope, like the way Solar Boy or Jesus or the sun comes along with the idea of power. With this little kid comes the idea of hope and belief in the future. And on top of that, along came the, idea, the desire, the desire to have children. So the, the instinct was turned on by the symbol or the symbol and the instinct are actually two different ways of seeing the same thing. One of them is Dionysian, the feeling, and the other is Apollo, the vision, the clarity. Right. So these things are tied. They're like almost one spirit. And this is where people would say stuff like it is a spirit because we can only interpret it through a pair of senses like feeling and, and vision. But it's almost like something comes into you and changes your entire nervous system and inspires you to participate in the game. It's quite an interesting idea. And so you see this motif show up all over the place in literature, like Christ himself, like you have this old stale a religious situation with the Jews and then Christ comes in as the redeemer he comes and he's like I'm the update and Neo in the Matrix the same same vibe and um, Samuel Beckett in Endgame so Endgame is that stale old boomer Kronos world and then at the very very end of it it's the cynical nuclear desolation environment at the very very end of it the two guys the two owl lads who are stuck in a rut look out the window and they see a little kid walking out who's like and it's it's shining divine child energy and then there's like this little glimmer of hope and it's an emotional thing that he, he uh, transmutes very well same with stanley kubrick you have that crazy long film 2001 space odyssey heavy dark film very very slow and um, suppressed and all this right at the end there's the shining shining solar boy that comes in the shining baby and that sort of represents that rejuvenation feeling and so there is this something very, very amazing tied to this concept, tied to this power, tied to this note. And when you're not hitting it, negative stuff happens. And we're currently going through that. We don't believe in the future. Talk to anybody nowadays and you'd be like, what do you, what do you think about the, the old future that's coming? And they'll be like, well, it'll be environmental disaster. And, um, you know, there's gonna, probably going to be a couple of civil wars. There's, uh, you know, the 1% are evil. And sure, like every the debt slavery is going to destroy us all. Sure, I can't get a house and all that. You talk to like I, I talk to like a, a girl. And I'm like, what do you think about kids? <laughs> what do you think about kids? And she's like, I like them, but I don't think I ever have them because I want to get financially stable first. And so you're stuck in that that rut of working 60 hour weeks, waiting until you have enough money to buy your house so that you're safe, so that you have stability. And it's not like this is very conscious. This is just an emotion when you're stuck in that, you know, little shitty office apartment in the big dirty city where you've lived in this fast-paced lifestyle and you're stressed quite a lot you don't think about kids you don't think this is oh this is where i'd like to raise my kid you don't think that at all and um that's that's a difficult thing because that destroys your belief in the future because you, you see how that's anchored in a story i don't believe in the future therefore and like in those people in lover warrior magician magician king once they got their conception of the world is a place worth fighting for, worth being in, and there is a future that can be had. Their their desire for a kid popped back up again. It's a story thing. Stories are tied to emotions. It's almost like you can fish this emotion out with a story. And so um, girls are going through that. Like men are going through the exact same thing as well. And people are trying to find out the reasons. And it could be something like this. Maybe it's as simple as our story for the future is desolate. Therefore, our instincts are responding accordingly. And we want to we want to find a solution, but we could be simply we have to gather around together and say, well, what story do we tell ourselves? And as I was, I was trying to describe the whole way through this, it seems simple, but there's so many mental limiting beliefs blocks that people will not allow themselves to do this job properly. They would rather they would. Rather, this is the one thing that will probably solve a lot. And they're like, no, no, we can't do that. Anything but that. Jeez, I said I wanted a solution, but I didn't want that solution. <laughs> Stop now, like, would you put your put the old put the old words back in your face there, would you? And so on top of that, you have um yes, you have this experience of the divine child. The future is the future is the environment is gonna go to waste. Humans are a parasite in the earth. It's 
Russ Cole says in True Detective, the sin of having a child, bringing a child into a, wor- a world that's 1% debt slavery with a d- dying environment and um, guaranteeing them nothing but like the end of the or the, the earth. Is, we, we all think we're coming into the end of days right now. And so that's that's like this heavy nihilism. Look at the way people go about the abortion thing. Like, you look, you can have a very, very interesting conversation about the idea of b- abortion and uh, as a concept of freedom. But you see people going around saying children are para- babies are parasites and like they're like fetuses are parasites like how how could we say something like that towards that symbol that idea that like the human spirit which is what the divine child is is a parasite and that's that resonates uh, that that tune resonates a very dark tune resonates with the idea of we are parasites on this planet on mother earth we are parasites on mother earth the baby is a parasite the fetus is a parasite inside a the mother it's very, very interesting how that stuff works and how it coincides with the dropping fertility rates, the, the lack of hope, the nihilism, the despair that's going on. Fascinating stuff. And so we ask ourselves, like, how do we re- rejuvenate that? And it just I've been, I've been ragging on Christianity a bit. I want to, again, just go over again. It's not, it's not strictly ideological. Like, for example, you can have a juicy Christian who's hitting all these notes. You know, they're hitting the strong warrior energy out of Christ. They're reading revelations. I mean, like, oh, he's going to come back and he's going to be literally a fucking steroid ridden body builder and he's going to smash all smash all the 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 worst people and all that and you're like (laughs) nice one and then you get another christian who's um deeply emotionally damaged and they're like oh this world is evil and hell and we're parasites and god's going to come down and destroy us and take the good people up into heaven and we deserve it humanity's scum and then you know the, the you can have that completely different take on the same idea because it's more to do with the notes that are getting hit Someone who, who is emotionally believes in the world is going to read Christianity different from someone who doesn't. So I'm suggesting there's something higher, there's something meta. It's like this geometry has to be filled properly. It's like these this logos, these principles up here. I literally sound like a madman. This logos, these principles, this geometry of psychology, they're like the notes and you have to be hitting them with the right stories. If you're like, the universe is shit, well then you're not going to hit the divine child thing. So the note's not going to ring and then you'll live in a story. And this is the story we live in where it's, it's like um, dissonant. It's like that dark, evil horror music. And that's actually grating on our souls and destroying us in a very, very interesting way. And how does that work? Because when you don't believe in the future, you don't believe in there being any point. And so your suffering amplifies. I talked about this in the last lecture. You need a story to tell your suffering. Why does my leg hurt? Why am I struggling? Why am I stressed out working this job? Oh, well, this is the reason. Well, if you don't believe in any future, there's no reason. That's nihilism. And we've got infected with that idea. That's been drilled into us. Now we can put that at the feet of Christianity. Maybe that was a misinterpretation of what the Bible is trying to say. Look, we can go with that. But nonetheless, we have to look at what happened. That belief that we cannot save ourselves and there cannot be a future, we can only wait passively, is eroding on our belief in ourselves, our belief that we can establish a future, we can participate in the future. That's nihilism. And since we've stripped out the whole God thing, it's gotten like it's just made it even worse because these memes are now spiraling out of control. The old order is ending and now these memes are, are, are like controlling us. These memes are stripped of their religious context. They've gone into like the unconscious. They're still ruling us like gods, but we think we're like free rational thinkers walking around being like, I know exactly, I know exactly what I'm doing, lads. You know, I know mental health is going out the window. Like, I know we just, just like fecking, you know, dynamite going off there. I know all that crack's happening. Like, you know, divine child, like shut up there. Like that's only nonsense. Like, but, but no, we were, we got this under control. Like totally, like there's nothing, there's nothing wrong here at all. Fertility rates, sure. Ah, sure. Look, humans are parasites. Like, <laughs> and so we have all this stuff building up and you can look at this one single symbol which is the divine child and our attitude towards it our cultural attitude towards the 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 child tells us everything that we need to know about what's going on it tells us it, it shows us how we feel about ourselves in the world and obviously we we we, we hate ourselves and that's that's a, a death spiral that you're in that's being possessed by some monstrous meme and so this is this is the ubermensch idea because the ubermensch sits on that same place it's like 
and it's not ideological. It's more like we, we just want we just want to hit the note. If you hit the note, the Ubermensch will. That's what the Ubermensch is. It's that note getting hit. You know, it's that it's that when when you it's the shining energy that type of thing. It's that that belief that faith in the future because when you believe in the kids, you believe in the future. It's ion. It's the eternal youth. It's all this stuff. I'm going crazy over here, and so the the conclusion. I th I'm getting from Nietzsche, and I think he's correct about this. Like, if you really think all this stuff true, and look at what's happened since he put it out there, we are not going to see this stuff redeemed. We're not going to see a solution to this until we do something spiritual. It seems to be a conclusively spiritual war. And the spiritual war is tied into this idea of how do we prepare ourselves for the future, orientated towards something that is healthy, and something we can believe in and something that is good, not based on our nonsense rationalizations, which are actually killing us right now, but based on something that is in line with nature and reality and God. And what you can do, as I said in the last one, is if you want to do an advanced bit of work on your on how to interpret what you want, because our brains are not very good or, or our reason is not very good at figuring that out, you can look at your emotions, Dionysus, your instincts, and see what they are attracted to naturally. And then you can look Apollyon style, look at your clarity of vision and see what these emotions are trying to model. And the things that we are attracted to are health. We all want to be fucking healthy. We all want to be beautiful. We all want to be excellent, strong, proud, majestic. We want that greatness. We want that we want to be walking among stat Greek statues. Like we want to be among beautiful art, brilliant paintings. We want to live in a world that seems like it's some type of fantastic rendition of reality, almost better than what reality is. We want to feel like we live in a supreme dream, a God's dream of some sort. We want to live in beauty. We want to be among the beautiful songs, the beautiful music. And we we crave that on such a deep level that you can strip everything. As Jordan Peterson's famous for saying this, you can strip everything from a nihilistic punk rocker, but he will get a spiritual experience from music because that's what it is. It's something in us deeper than our reason, than our ability to t think we're nihilistic or pessimistic. We'll still connect with what we believe matters, which is the connection with God's order in the universe, which is divine. There's no way that can be severed. You could be trapped in a box and you could still hum and still find God's order. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. And that is absolutely our instincts, what they point towards. It's obvious, it's simple, but everything in us has been reasoned to move against that. We, we turn good into something abstract and kind of nonsensy and it's sort of killing us in some sense. And so all we need is a vision of how would we organize ourselves towards excellence, towards beauty, towards health? As I said already, that's the only thing we need to be asking. This is what we're for. We're not, we're not out here doing any hate. We're just saying we're for being beautiful. Doesn't everybody want to be beautiful and happy and strong? Doesn't everybody want that? Who would be against that? Why would anybody be against that? Does, are people really, like, unless they're possessed by absolute hate for reality, but then that's, that's a far more serious problem in their part. We're saying, let's set a standard. Let's say, let's reach for this. Let's go for this. This seems good. This will save us. Let's prepare the future. We have so much potential right now. Let's work our future towards making everybody feel effulent, powerful, happy, as healthy as possible. Let's set that as our goal. That's our agenda, if you will. And that's what the Ubermensch is calling us towards. The Ubermensch is the symbol of that. And it's only a feeling right now. That's when people read through it. Nietzsche is like, well, Nietzsche didn't give us an exact plan and all that. Well, it's a spiritual thing. It's a psychological thing. You need to have a, you need to first be sort of led by your instincts towards a vague image. And as you get closer to it, as it begins to manifest in reality, it will become more clear. And that's literally his entire project why aren't we working towards that? And on that bombshell, I'm going to have to leave you. Talk to you later, people. So a consistent theme in this and my last couple of videos have been taking a new attitude, new perspective on mental health. For example, people have a very, very one dimensional and incompetent view of how mental health works. And obviously it's not working culturally because we see spiraling rates of depression going up, spiraling, spiraling rates of anxiety going up, spiraling rates of everything's going bad. Something's wrong. You know, no one wants to say it. There's something, people are doing stuff that's not correct. Now we have this 
single unnuanced black and white paradigmic view right now where we're like all right well you just take drugs and make everything go away or it, it, like it's no like the, the similar problem was with the old christian view where it's like well, all emotions are satan and you should just ignore them in some sense and it's no we need something more sophisticated in my last video i was talking about the more advanced way of looking at this stuff where all of your emotions are like energies in like like fires like gods that they saw in the past that are speaking to you and you need like Zeus to regulate them. Now, if you're Christian, you can take this approach that they are all angels or perhaps demons, whatever you want. And Christ is sitting there in the throne being like, Jesus, would you shut up? Like, what do you want? And he's trying to sort them out. And he's trying to organize them all towards a his higher purpose, his higher goal. It's that type of idea. There's a more sophisticated way that you can understand this stuff. And Jordan Peterson most certainly blew open the doors when he, he started to introduce Jung's thought back to it. But it is fundamentally a Jungian take on these things, which was built on many people in the Western tradition doing it. And we are looking to, to move towards this way of looking at things because this perspective actually makes it easier to deal with with your emotions. When you understand your emotions as trying to help you and they're bringing you a message as opposed to what we tend to do, which is think that they're evil and must be shut up and must and we poorly interpret what they're saying, that actually causes the majority of our suffering in the world. Like, and everybody's out there to try get rid of pain of some sort. They're like, all right, get the car or get the food, keep eating the comfort food or something like that or uh, or uh, like keep, keep studying about whatever they're studying about because they're having an existential crisis and all that. Your your emotions and all levels are trying to help you. And so a simple exercise like I gave out for free in my last one was um, do your five fears and that will take you a million, million steps further than almost anything else you're going to come across because that's speaking to something in you that's causing your pain and it will actually serve it in the way that it wants to be served without cooking to it and it will actually make you stronger, healthier and juicier. And so this is a fascinating thing because it's centered on that idea of storytelling. You're trying to storytell your emotions to make yourself and to take a perspective on your emotions that almost give them personality, which is what is so hard for us because we imagine that we're, we're robots and there is nothing in us that is alive in that type of sense. But look, take this view and it works. That's all that really matters to me. And so my whole attitude here is that we can actually take people on and teach them this stuff in depth. We can go through their individual situations, get them to do those exercises, pull this stuff out, get them to speak to these things. And then it, it models their world a lot better. It creates a perspective for them that will take them through the rest of their life. It's a skill that we can teach. So this is what we're doing with the consultations. On top of that, it's, it's not only in understanding your, your own emotions for yourself that's powerful, but when it comes to speaking to other people, it makes you a lot better at doing that because when you understand what they're going through, you might realize you're speaking to Aries as opposed to a person. And even further, when you're doing stuff like storytelling properly, that is like, you know, I don't know, marketing. If you're an artist, you're writing a book or something like that, any of these type of things, your ability to understand human motivation is the key towards being good and competent at this stuff. Edward Bernays was essentially a psychologist and uh, quite an evil marketer. And if you listen to any anybody talk about storytelling technique, they will almost always say, study human behavior, psychology, and emotions and motivation. Don't bother with those storytelling courses where it's like beginning, middle, and end. Just study what makes people tick. And that will take you 10, 10 times further than any other stuff because it's it's about what, what people watch stories for is because it makes them experience those emotional dramatic conflicts that's going on inside of them. That's why Aristotle said stories end with catharsis. So stories drive all of this. Stories is one of my main focal points, but it's fundamentally about getting mastery over emotions, what people would call emotional intelligence, but it's about having an intelligent view of emotions. It's not, there's not some mystical skill that you get when you go into the top of the mountain and uh, do samurai work for thousands of years or something like that. It's something that you can pragmatically learn. So if you're interested in this, links in the description you can get a consultation with us and I have a few boyos in the back that I'm going to get a few boyos in the back like that I'm, <laughs> that I'm going to I'm going to get working on this stuff as well so you will have a, a team to work with and I hope to see you there and uh, yeah pop in and we'll get you all juicy and you will not be a pug bye bye